community since 1970. This is WIS Awareness. Good morning and thanks for joining us for Awareness Today. I'm your host, Leland Pender. And today we'll be discussing what some people describe as the predatory payday loan business or more formally deferred presentation services and check cashing. When people need extra cash, oftentimes low-income consumers and earners turn to these companies to get that fast money. But of course, they are borrowing the money and the terms they agree to to pay it back are usually not in their best interest and lead to a large amount of debt over a way longer period of time. So joining me this morning is attorney Sue Berkowitz, the director of the SC Appleseed Justice Legal Center. And you all bill yourselves, Sue, as a voice for low-income South Carolinians for social, legal, and economic justice. So thank you for being here, first oh, of all. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And to begin, just tell us um, tell us more about current laws regulating this industry in our state and what sure. you see in your office with people that you serve. Well, South Carolina has had payday lending in our state for decades now. Mm -hmm. um, part of the reason is, is that we've got one of the largest payday lenders in the country just up the road in Spartanburg, Advance America. And they're, they're headquartered. They're there. headquartered mm -hmm. in Spartanburg, mm -hmm. but they're a national organization, a mm -hmm. national company. They're traded on the stock market. And so we've been uh, seeing problems really starting to creep up over the years and first started working on the laws in 1999. Mm -hmm. okay. And under the laws in 1999, the legislature had intended for people to only have one loan at a time. And I will have to admit that the payday lenders understood what they were doing a whole lot better than us mm -hmm. when we were advocating because it was new. Having clients or having constituents that were even banked was a new thing for us because so many low-income uh, consumers are kept out of the banking system. Mm -hmm. So these consumers would, would take a check and give it to a payday lender and maybe give them a check for $125 and the lender would just roll it over and over and over and over again. So in 1999, we really did understand that there needed to be something regulating them. And there was. There, mm -hmm. there became laws that, that started to regulate the payday lending industry. And the good part about it was is that people couldn't go to jail if the payday lending check bounced. They couldn't go to jail if they closed their account. They couldn't go to jail if they stopped payment. But what ended up happening is the payday lenders were very, very clever on how they wrote the law. And we wouldn't see somebody with just one payday loan. At that time, you could only borrow $300, and they had a $15 fee. But $15 fee over a two-week period or a one-month period would be $45 for that $300. Mm -hmm. And if you borrowed $300 because you didn't have any money and you couldn't uh, afford to pay what you needed with the $300, were you going to have $345 at the end of two weeks or a month? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, of course. So they would say, well, just, you know, let us cash the check, and or if you don't have the money to pay it off, mm -hmm. go to the next payday lender, borrow some money, mm. pay us off, and then we'll lend you some more. And that sounds good, but, I mean, it's obviously not. It but obviously, people do that. People, people were doing that mm -hmm. to the point where... Um, in, in 2009, 4.5 million payday loans were made in South Carolina alone. Wow. So they changed the law. And they have a, they have a, a database. And you can only take out one loan at a time. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pay that loan off, you can't take out another loan. But they raised how much you could borrow. Right. That's where I was going to ask you next. And that changed. That threshold changed. And so people, again, taking out these loans for whatever amount. But over time, it could literally cost them hundreds, if not thousands, of more dollars. Absolutely. So you borrow $550 and you owe 682 mm -hmm. And you pay it off. And the next day, you can go back. The next business day, you can go back and borrow money all over again. Because if you don't have $682 at the beginning of the month, mm -hmm. when they take it out of your check at the end of the two-week pay period or the end of the month, you're not going to have any money to live off of. So tell us why... As you know, um, as backwards as that sounds, why have so many people taken advantage and participated in these services? Partly because they make it so easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you see a payday lender or even an auto title lender, mm -hmm. what do they say? No credit check. Mm -hmm. So if you perceive or you do have bad credit and you're in an emergency, 
because let's say you live in a city where they have the highest utility rates in the country and you got a high utility bill and mm -hmm. you can't afford it and you don't want your power turned off and then somebody makes it fast and easy, you're going to go borrow that money. And in addition, a lot of the larger banks aren't going to make small loans. Mm -hmm. Problem is, while they're saying they're only charging you 15% or $15 per hundred, in fact, if you're borrowing over and over and over and over again, mm -hmm. that actually turns into 391% interest in a year. And we have looked at the records because payday lenders, we actually have really good records in South Carolina to see what happens with borrowing. We don't with auto title lenders because they bury themselves in with all the other lenders, mm -hmm. all the other lenders that don't charge as much. They charge about 300% auto title lenders. Wow. And they take your car as collateral. Mm -hmm. But payday lenders in South Carolina, the last reporting period, there are about 104,000 people who took out payday loans in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. But 818,000 loans were made. Wow. So that means I can't do those numbers that quickly, but wow. Yeah. <laughs> is about eight loans a borrower. Wow. $51 million came out of the pockets of those individuals, people who could least afford it mm -hmm. because they needed money to pay off an emergency and then that loan became their emergency. Now this is something that affects all groups, uh, groups of people, but especially African Americans and minority groups in yes. low income neighborhoods and, and whatnot. Um, one of the industry's defenses, and we'll talk more about this in the next segment, but is that they're helping these people get into the, uh, the banking business or the credit building business. That's like kind of the service or the benefit of all of this and the look on your face says not so much <laughs> so how do you justify that yeah i better keep my day job i could never play poker <laughs> um, no it that that sounds great doesn't it sound great mm -hmm. i mean when people say they're providing a service but if you're having to borrow eight times in a row to keep yourself from going under that's not a service. You're already under it, honestly. You're under already. Yeah, yeah. And that's why we're, we looked at it 10 years ago and we're working on a whole new project again, looking at debt in communities of color. Because if you can't get to that zero point, how do you get ahead mm -hmm. if you're constantly paying debt? Mm -hmm. And that's not a service. A service would be finding uh, a, a loan product where people are making a payment that they can afford and they can afford to pay their regular monthly bills. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we have to look at. How do we change the laws and tighten up so that somebody doesn't have to go back eight times before they finally fall apart or they finally just give up? This is something you're working on with uh, at least one lawmaker we know about. Absolutely. And coming up after the break, we will talk about that and talk with that lawmaker who says this actually has a pretty significant and major impact on many of her constituents. What she's doing with the SC Appleseed Justice Center to try and bring about change. Learning is big at Adventure, the largest children's museum in the Southeast. Meet Eddie, the world's largest boy. Sit in the cockpit of a real 757 or discover something tasty in the cooking lab. You can start planning your big day online at adventure.org. South Carolina State Museum, open for fun. Go on a mind-bending journey that brings you face-to-face -face with one of the most unknown objects of the cosmos, black holes. Space and time mean nothing to these collapsed stars of immeasurable size. Voyage through the galaxies in search of answers in black holes. Now playing in the planetarium. See black holes for free in April when you purchase an Explore 2 combo ticket. On April 13th, history will be made at Benedict College. After 148 years, the college that was founded by a woman will be led by a woman. Join us for this historic occasion and celebration of the inauguration of Dr. Rosalind Clark Artis. It's a great opportunity for you to support the Best of BC Scholarship Fund by sponsoring or joining us at the inaugural gala on Friday, April 13th at 7 p.m. at the State Museum. For more information, visit the Benedict College website or call 803-705-4743. What makes a great custom suit? Fabric sourced from the finest Italian mills. Details hand-picked by you. And made right here in America. I'm Joseph Abood. This is my custom suit. Now available at Men's Warehouse. 
It's springtime and we're buying coats. Burlington has everything. I came here for a skirt. Sandals. Great shirts. For, for the, the home. home. Beautiful handbags. Getting organized. All the great brands at a fraction of the cost. Burlington. Without Coat Factory. I get it. Learning is big at Adventure, the largest children's museum in the Southeast. Meet Eddie, the world's largest boy. Sit in the cockpit of a real 757 or discover something tasty in the cooking lab. You can start planning your big day online at adventure.org. All right, welcome back to Awareness this morning. Of course, the South Carolina legislature back in session now, and this is something one uh, lawmaker we know of is working on right now and in the future. I'm joined by Senator Wendy Brawley from uh, Richland and Sumter counties. Thank you for being here. Thank you, but not a senator or representative. Representative, excuse <laughs> me. I me. apologize. <laughs> I apologize. Representative Wendy Brawley here this morning. Tell us um, how this affects the people that live in your, your district there in Sumter and Richland counties and how you want to change this for them. Well, it does. It does uh, affect a lot of my constituents because, as you know, um, this is an issue uh, that has as much to do with income and uh, sustainable income, livable wages, as it does with just the, the buying patterns, the borrowing patterns. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our folks in, in our rural communities, you know, work minimum wage jobs. Um, and so they are mostly impacted by this type of um, predatory process. Mm -hmm. So finding some solutions to help them, I think it's, it's a two-part problem. And I'll be more than willing to talk about it. it. It has to do with improving their incomes, first of all. Uh, and then it has to do with protecting them whenever they find themselves in the need for a bridge loan. So sometimes people, uh, things sound good and they don't really know how to decipher or what you know criteria to use to really determine is this good or bad for me. How do you increase that, that kind of knowledge for those people who come up against these situations? That's an excellent question and I think Appleseed is doing a really good job Thank of you. trying to address the community need by going into communities, particularly uh, underserved banking communities, and really having a dialogue with the community and letting them know that, you know, here are the warning signs. If you're doing this or you have relatives that are involved with this and they're getting multiple loans, one right after the other, then this is something you might want to be precautionary about. So I really applaud you for that Thank work. You. And they're doing, I was at one of their forums um, recently that they had here in Columbia, and it was very well attended. Mm -hmm. And people really were receiving the information, some because they were victims, others because they had family members who were victims. So uh, Dr. Burke or... Dr. Berkowitz? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Just, I'm just another another promotion. Yeah, we, we like them, but you know. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mrs. Berkowitz, yeah. tell us how you all are working together to fix this. Like, what does that look like? Well, I think it has to be two pronged. Mm -hmm. I think that also you have to go into local communities and determine what the need of the community might be. That's why we're having uh, town hall meetings in six different areas of the state to actually one look for local solutions but also looking at what needs to be done on a state level. Mm -hmm. uh, while our legislature has incrementally done some work to address payday lending, not so much with auto title lending. I think that what folks don't realize is we're a what we call a deregulated state. Mm -hmm. And as a deregulated state, uh, interest rates can be whatever a, a lender wants to charge. Now payday lenders are limited to $15 per hundred, but like I said, that's 391%. Auto title lenders, as long as they file their maximum interest rate with the South Carolina Department of Consumer Affairs and post it in their place of business, as can any lender, they can charge what they want. Mm. And while they say it's a free market and people can come in and they can, you know, they don't have to borrow, if there is not a responsible lender, a lender that's going to charge you as a responsible rate and do their lending looking at your ability to repay, it allows people to be taken advantage of. So those laws need to be looked at, but also we need to be looking at should products be developed by those who want to have 
uh, responsible lending in their communities and how do we make that happen? Now, I did reach out to the Financial Services Center of America about this. They're a trade association uh, for this industry. They were previously called the National Check Cashers Association, but changed their name in 2000 <laughs> to reflect a changing industry, they say. Now, I asked them about what we're talking about today, obviously, and if they had a response or any justification for how they do business. And I want to read their statement. It's long, but bear with me here. They say the Financial Service Center industry is among the most highly regulated of all consumer financial services providers. Every state in the country regulates short-term lending and there are more than 12 different federal laws regulating these financial products. Then they go on to say here that add to this industry self-regulation and consumers own good judgment and it's no surprise that consumer complaints against the industry have been consistently on the decline for the past 10 years. Contrary to popular belief, 75% of the people FISCA members service are employed full-time and critics of small dollar lending often ignore the fact that the financial service center industry provides credit to some of our nation's most underserved populations who do not have access to traditional banking. And then one last quote here. They say that uh, they close by saying without these products, millions of consumers will be left with no choice but to turn to unregulated lenders who are based offshore and elsewhere, while others will be forced to bounce checks, pay bills late and suffer without access to credit. I know that was a lot there. Um, take it in for a second. You hear that. How do you respond to their their claims, their defense rather? Well, honestly, I think they're accurate in saying that there are uh, large populations, particularly in minority communities, of unbanked individuals. That's probably very true. Um, what also needs to be true is that we should not permit an industry to take advantage of an already vulnerable population. So while I understand the need to have bridge loans, particularly, you know, people get sick, they have a dental issue, they have a um, high utility bill, mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of a sudden they're making choices between that and paying for rent. So we know that there is a need for the kinds of bridge loans that are being provided, but there also has to be uh, a requirement on the part of legislators to make certain that people who find themselves in those positions and need those loans aren't automatically driven into a well that they can never get out of. And I think that's really, really important. And, and it, it cannot be ignored that the people who are taking these loans are being, um, most of the time, their situation is most of, most vulnerable and they're being taken advantage of in the process. Okay, so after the break here, a quick break here, we'll talk about what options do you have in the meantime to get this fixed or to get out of these situations. We'll be right back. It's only a matter of time until your check engine light comes on, or worse yet, your car needs repair. That could mean a big surprise auto repair bill. Those repairs are more expensive than ever. A new engine can be over $5,000. A new transmission over $4,000. That's why it's so important you call CarShield today. CarShield is the number one auto protection company in the country. I like CarShield because they were reliable, they were affordable, and they were trustworthy. Well, I think everybody should have car shield. Once your manufacturer's warranty is expired, there's just no big bills. If we needed repairs, car shield was there for us. Now it's your turn to get the peace of mind that comes with having car shield so you can worry less about auto repairs. Call or go online right now to get car shield for yourself. Friendly, knowledgeable, money saving representatives are available 24 hours a day. So if your car is 20 years old or newer, just tell us the make and model of your car or truck to get an instant plan quote. In a matter of minutes, you can be covered. I was elated that I had car shield. I was more than happy. There's no fun when you have a car and it's broken and you can't pay for it to get it fixed. Here's how CarShield works. When your car needs repair, you take it to your favorite mechanic or even your dealer, and CarShield gets them paid directly. That's why CarShield is America's number one auto protection provider. CarShield is just the best thing to take away the fear that when something is going to go wrong with your car, because it will, and CarShield is going to be there to back you up. My experience with CarShield is that they absolutely come through every time I need them. If my car breaks down, I can count on CarShield to cover it for me. 
Carshall definitely has my back. Now it's the time to make the smart choice and protect yourself from sky-high auto repair bills. Call now for a free and instant protection plan quote. It's only a matter of time until repairs are needed. And once your car breaks down, it's too late. Call 1-800-440-7215. That's 1-800-440-7215. All right, welcome back this morning. To families who take advantage of these services, who say, I don't want to, but I have to, what other options do they have? Until we get some kind of fix or new guidelines in place, what can they do? Um, I I mean, I think that there are responsible lenders out there. Um, Maybe not as close in the community and right now doing things quite as fast as a payday lender or or an auto title lender, but credit unions by law can never charge more than 18% interest. Community banks are really starting to think about building products. I know there's been a bank on uh, effort here in Columbia, and we're going to be working with um, city leaders to think about what alternatives can be brought into the city. Some other states like Texas have come up with some really innovative programming. Um, But for the person who's faced with a payday lender right now, a payday loan, they should remember that you can't go to jail for owing a payday loan. If your check bounces, you cannot go to jail for that payday loan. If you stop payment for that payday loan, you cannot go to jail. If you close your bank account, because of the payday loan, you cannot go to jail. Now, I will say, if you've got other checks that are outstanding and those bounce, that is a problem. But so there is some relief out there. The other thing is is that it may be you can go to legal services, South Carolina Legal Services, or reach out to our organization, and you can find us on the web, scjustice.org, and we'll help you get to someone who can help you. And there are what because payday lenders are not supposed to make a loan to someone without figuring out if somebody has the ability to pay. Mm-hmm. And if someone makes a thousand dollars a month or a thousand dollars in a two week period and they've got rent for five hundred dollars and they've got utilities for three hundred dollars and food for four hundred dollars, there's not enough money to pay that payday loan and that's a violation of our state law. So we need to make sure that those, lo- that those laws are actually enforced by our state regulators, but we also need to be thinking the way we do our laws, are these really the right way to do it? And if we're still seeing people making serial loans, then maybe we need to be thinking we didn't do enough, we didn't go far enough, and that's why it's so wonderful to have Representative Brawley here to talk about all of this. Give me kind of an idea of the, the pulse on this issue. Um, is it a top priority um, for many you know, people? It, it, as far as the General Assembly, I have not heard this mentioned as a top priority, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean it can't become one. Mm-hmm. Um, as I said earlier, South Carolina is a poor state. And the reason why we are a poor state is because we don't pay our people enough money. You have a lot of people who work every day, some of them two jobs, Mm -hmm. and still don't make $15 an hour. And as long as we have that scenario in our state, we're going to continue to have a perpetual need for small loans being, you know, given to people who find themselves in emergency situations. Mm -hmm. I would like to see us do more to try to combine our efforts, just like the small businesses do, with microloans for small businesses, particularly minority-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. We can do that with these kind of products. We can partner with some community development corporations across the state and have a micro-lending program that allows people who find themselves in need of a small-term loan because they have a dental episode or a child gets sick and there's no health insurance or whatever the case might be that threatens their ability to sustain themselves to come into that community development corporation and with the help of maybe a small community bank they make loans. I think we would have a lot more compassion in terms of how these loans are being done and we would not have as many people falling victim particularly to payday or predatory lending loans. Last question here, Um, talk about the future. Just what you hope to accomplish, maybe even a timetable. I don't mean to put any put you on the spot or any constraints like that, but what's the future look like for this issue with you all? For South Carolina Appleseed, we're partnering with NAACP and Christian Action Council. We're going around the state. We've had two town halls. We're we're going to four more locations. Darlington is next in April, Mm -hmm. um, as well as Rock Hill, and we'll also be in North Charleston and in Greenville. Part of it is, is to identify community leaders in those communities because 
we can't do this alone, and, and, and Representative Brawley can't do it alone just by coming up with a legislative solution at the State House. And it's going to be up to communities to work on local solutions, whether it's working with the CDC and figuring out a lending product, whether it's looking at ordinances locally to see if there's things that can be tightened up. I mean, there's a number of things that done. But um, one thing that, that's been hard for me to accept as a lawyer is I might not always have the answers, but if we talk to the community and the people that are affected and we work together, we can come up with some really good answers. Yeah, and get all come together for sure. Mm -hmm. It takes more than one person on any issue to enact or affect some change. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you both for being here. Uh, good luck to both of you and all thank that you're you. working with on this issue. And we'll have to follow it and, and see what happens in the future. That would be great. Right. Thank, right. you. thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Uh, more awareness coming up after the break. Hi, I'm Holly Robinson-Pete. And I'm Rodney Pete. And after 16 years in the NFL, it came as no surprise that knee surgery might be in my future. And when the doctor said Rodney needed to lose weight before surgery, we knew that Lipazine could help him lose four times more weight. It's America's number one weight loss supplement. I've already lost 30 pounds in four pant sizes. I didn't need a prescription or meal plan. I've lost 10 pounds. I have more energy, more stamina. We eat our favorite foods and still lose four times more weight. I'm very impressed with Rodney's weight loss. His blood pressure and cholesterol have really improved. I recommend Lipazine because it's made from the rare konjac root, which contains glucomannan, a very safe and effective weight loss supplement. Lipazine has no harmful side effects. No caffeine, no jitters, no counting calories. No cleanses. No starve diets. No boot camps. Nothing in your lifestyle needs to change. Just add Lipazine. In a clinical study, people were not asked to change their lifestyle and simply add lipazine. As a result, they lost not just twice the weight, not three times, but they lost four times more weight just by adding lipazine. And 78% of that weight loss was fat, not water, but fat. Rodney and I guarantee that you will lose weight or your money back. Can we say that? Yep, guaranteed or your money back. So get lipazine and lose four times more weight. Now you can lose four times more weight. Just add Lipazine for only $29.95. Call right now and we'll double your order for free and ship it free too. And for a limited time, we'll double the size of each bottle for free. So now you have four times the Lipazine for just $29.95. Plus, you'll get MetaboUp Plus to help boost your energy and metabolism. But you must call. Call 800-873-3016. 800-873-3016. All right. Thanks again to my guests this morning, uh, Wendy Brawley in the House of Representatives and also Sue Berkowitz from the SC Appleseed Justice Center here in Columbia. If you want to learn more about either of their services, you can head to their websites or their phone numbers. Of course, that's all online. But for now, thank you for joining us for Awareness this morning. We'll see you back here next week. On April 13th, history will be made at Benedict College after